Hello everybody, I thought we're here, and today we are going to be starting to talk about uh, analytic number theory. And uh, the basis of analytic number theory are uh, a certain class of functions called arithmetic functions. So let me write that on the board. And arithmetic functions, you might think, uh, well, arithmetic means adding and, and subtracting and multiplying and dividing. Well, that's, that's not really what we're going to be dealing with. What we're going to be dealing with in arithmetic functions are uh, functions f that go from the nats to, um, to uh, complex. So the nats, which are positive uh, integers basically, so everything going 1, 2, 3, on and on, and I, I always forget whether you add 0 in this or not. Uh, honestly, this, this notation, nats and positive integers, which is denoted z plus, all of that um, is, is, is fairly irrelevant, but an arithmetic function is comprised, is, is basically any function which uh, takes these numbers uh, the positive integers and spits out some complex number and complex doesn't necessarily necessarily um, mean that it has to be imaginary for for example the number uh, seven is a complex number uh, the number seven plus three i is also a complex number the number uh, zero is also a complex number so so complex numbers can uh, do not necessarily need to have imaginary parts so an arithmetic function let me reiterate. Let me reiterate: is any function which takes the positive integers or or the nats and spits out some complex number. So now let's let's discuss some uh, important arithmetic functions because there are many, and uh, oftentimes the important arithmetic functions which we like to discuss in analytic number theory are the ones which deal with the divisors of a certain number. So uh, let's begin. Uh, let's begin with the divisor function, how, uh, how timely, which is, which is called d, and it's called d of n, so n is our input, and well, what does this function do? d of n goes from, as we said, nats to uh, complex, and what it does is it takes some n, and it basically counts the number of divisors of n, and it spits out a number saying, okay, well, this is the number of divisors that n has. So if n were equal to 6, then uh, d of 6, well, how many uh, divisors does 6 have? 1, 2, 3, and 6. That is equal to 4. And d of, we could even do something like 8. Well, d of 8, well, how many divisors does 1 have? Uh, does a have? Uh, eight divisors are one, two, four, and eight, and that's also four. And well, now let's think about okay, well, what if we have a prime number? What if we input a prime number? Well, d of seven, seven is a prime number, so d of seven, well, how many divisors does seven have? Seven's divisors are only one and seven, so this is equal to two. So for d of p, where where p is prime, uh, d of, uh, no, so for p, such that p is prime, d of p is always equal to 2. And now you might be wondering, well, what is d of 1? Well, d of 1 is simply 1, because 1 only has itself as a divisor. And uh, that's 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 the reason why in uh, most often you don't you don't see uh, one being listed as a prime number in mathematics textbooks, and that's why you see two, three, and and five, and so on and so forth listed, but not one. It's because d of those numbers is two, but d of one is definitely not two. So this, in essence, is is how you define prime number, and th there are many other ways of defining prime numbers, but this is probably the uh, the most concrete one, which reflects the uh, statements in uh, number theory math textbooks today. So uh, let's discuss a different function. Let's discuss sigma, and this is not this is not the big sigma, which is uh, meant to uh, denote a sum. This is the little sigma, which is meant to denote the sum of divisors. So sum of divisors. 
So this is the sum of divisors function. Well, you, you can you can guess what this means. Uh, a lot of analytic theory uh, function names are fairly intuitive. So um, the sum of divisors function sigma of n says, okay, well if you have some uh, input where n is in the um, n is in the nets, and uh, then you take the number, uh, th th then you take a look at the divisors of n. So let's say n is equal to 6 again, then the divisors are 1, 2, 3, and 6, and basically you add up the divisors. It's, it's fairly self-explanatory. So well, when we add up 1, 2, we get 3, 3, 3, we get 6, and 6, 6, we get 12. So sigma of 6 is equal to 12. And and now let's say, oh, well, let's take sigma of a prime number, just, just to follow up from taking uh, d of a prime number. Well, sigma of p, if p is prime, sigma of p is equal to p plus 1. And why is that? Well, if you had sigma of 7, then the seven, 7's divisors are only 7 in itself, uh, or, or only 1 in itself. So then you take 1 plus 7, and that is equal to p plus 1. So wonderful. Now that is a good description of little sigma, which is the sum advisors function. Now let's take sigma sub k. So sigma sub k of n is basically the sum of divisors function exponentiated to some k. Well, what does that mean uh, mathematically? Well, it means, let's say you have some number n, let's say n is equal to 6, just for simplicity, then uh, the, six, the divisors of 6 are 1, 2, 3, and 6, and um, sigma sub k says, well, let's take each of these dividers and exponentiate them to some power k, and, and k is definitely given, so you won't see sigma sub k, you will see sigma sub 2 of n, or sigma sub uh, 5 of n, uh, if you're actually evaluating something. If not, you'll see sigma sub k. So uh, sigma sub k says, Let's take each of these divisors, exponentiate them, to, exponentiate them to some power k, and let's add them up. So let's say uh, let's let's take sigma sub two of six. Well, sigma sub two of six says let's take one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus six squared. One squared is one. 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and 6 squared is 36. You add this up, you get 40 plus 10 is equal to 50. Wonderful. So that is sigma sub k. And um, we have many other functions, arithmetic functions, which we would like to look at, one of which is uh, pi. And pi, when you hear it, uh, always comes off, oh, you know, pi is equal to 3.14, which is equal to uh, the circumference over the diameter, which is equal to sigma um, 6, root of 6 times sigma 1 over i squared, i equals 1 to infinity, and uh, a bunch of other things. But, but pi, in this sense, is not the number pi, but the function pi. So pi of n says, let's take some number n, and let's take the number of prime numbers less than n, or, or less, less than or equal to n, I believe, and let's, let's, let's count them up. So uh, sigma, uh, or pi of n, excuse me, can be defined as uh, the, the number of, of uh, p, su, su, p, p prime, such that, s dot t dot is, is the abbreviation for such that. So the number of primes such that uh, n is greater than or equal to p. So it counts the number of primes less than or equal to some n. And uh, an interesting note, a side note here to make, is that whenever we have, uh, is that, is that uh, 
in modern mathematics, perhaps the, the, the cornerstone of modern mathematics is the prime number theorem, which uh, initially Hadamard, uh, a great, great mathematician, uh, proved uh, with complex analysis. It was a very intricate proof and it was quite detailed and not many people could understand it. And then Paul Erdos came along and he was a great Hungarian mathematician. In fact, probably one of the most prolific mathematicians of all time. And what he did was he, he produced a, an entirely, he produced a very intuitive uh, proof, which many people could understand. And it was, it was extremely simple and people were astonished saying, oh my God, this, this guy's a genius. He, he proved the prime number theorem again using simpler, uh, simpler proof methods. And the prime number theorem is the theorem that says uh, pi of x are the number of prime numbers less than or equal to x can be approximated using this uh, you can using this this uh, this expression, which is x divided by log of x. And now, what does this mean? Well, if you if you take like three divided by log of three, that that that's that's not a that's not a uh, that's not a uh, real well no it is a real number excuse me that's not an integer and and usually pi of x well pi of x maps to well of course it maps to the complex numbers but you would expect it to be an integer because there's always an integer number of primes less than or equal to some number. And um, so what does this mean? Well, this tilde sign right here is uh, not an approximation exactly, but this is equivalent, this, this statement here is equivalent to saying that the limit as x tends to infinity of pi of x over x divided by log x is equal to 1. So as x approaches infinity, this is the, these two uh, are asymptotic. And that is what this tilde sign means. That means asymptotic. So this is the famous prime number theorem. And uh, we will explain an equivalent definition of the prime number theorem in our description of the next arithmetic function to come, which is, uh, well, in our next two arithmetic functions to come. So first we will discuss capital lambda, capital lambda of n. And this is the von, von Mangolt, the von Mangolt function. And what this function is uh, saying is, well, if I take some n, then that n has a unique prime factorization. And this follows from the uh, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, or, or fundamental theorem of arithmetic, or fundamental theorem of numbers, whichever you like to call it. Uh, Euclid said that uh, every number n, well, every every integer number n, uh, or positive integer number n, can be represented as uh, some as as some product of various ver varying powers of certain primes certain distinct primes. So you can have p1 to the alpha uh, times p2 to the beta times p3 to the gamma and so on and so forth. And uh, to, to, let's say pr to the omega, just to be precise. So every n can be represented in this form. And what this von Mangold function lambda or capital lambda does is it, uh, it, it, it's a piecewise function, so it splits into three parts. So lambda of n is defined as zero if n is equal to one, zero if uh, n has more than one pr uh, distinct prime factor, and it is equal to log of p if n is equal to p to the uh, p to the alpha. So wow, that was a mouthful. It's it's a pretty uh, 
pretty big piecewise function. And uh, these two cases, well, this first case especially, is, is very simple to understand. That's, uh, that's, that's all right. But the second case, well, what does this mean? If n has more than, uh, one, more than one distinct prime factor, that means if n cannot be ex uh, expressed as a simple p to the alpha, if it has to be written as p to the alpha, p2 to the beta, then it, uh, it is going to be equal to zero. And uh, that, that is another reason why we don't consider one as a prime number, because then uh, every, every number n would have, uh, well, I guess other than one would, uh, would have uh, lambda of n is equal to zero. So then, uh, so, so this, is, this is pretty intuitive. For example, six has uh, lambda of six is equal to zero because it has two distinct prime factors, which are uh, two and three. And uh, now, so let's look at the last case, which is log p if n is equal to p to the alpha. That's fairly intuitive as well. Uh, there's not much to understand there. You just get rid of this alpha and you take log of that. So wonderful. This is uh, lambda of n, which is the von Mangold function, and we'll see why it is so useful in uh, the next arithmetic function, as well as the following videos. This is a very important arithmetic function. So the next arithmetic function that we have in stock is psi. Psi, 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 I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to say it, but, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if it actually has a name, but uh, psi of n is defined as sigma of lambda of n, n less than or equal to x. Uh, oh, my apologies. Sigma, actually, well, let me rewrite this here. Sigma of n is equal to x less than or equal to n uh, lambda of x. Wonderful. Yes, so that is the psi function and why this is so important and why the lambda or van Mungold function is so important is that the statement, um, the statement limit uh, x tending to infinity of psi of x over x is equal to one, that is a statement, well that is equal to, or is equivalent to, the prime number theorem, which states that pi of x, the, the limit of x tending to infinity of pi of x over x divided by log x is equal to one. So this is a wonderful statement right here. And this is why this psi function and this lambda function are so important. So wonderful. Now let's move on to some simpler, perhaps more understandable arithmetic functions. So uh, next in stock, we have the number one function. Now this is bold face one, it appears uh, quite often in mathematics, it appears in from everywhere to number theory to uh, measure theory, but they mean different things in different places. So in analytic number theory, this boldface number one is a function. It's an arithmetic function, and it means that number one of n is equal to one for all n. This is a wonderful function, perhaps my favorite function on all of mathematics because it is so simple yet so useful. So we will see how it is useful in the following videos when we talk about Dirichlet convolutions. But that is for a later time. Now the next simple function, uh, not, not a simple function, it's simple functions are a different class of functions uh, to be discussed in ergodic theory. But the next function, which is simple, to be discussed is the arithmetic function i of n, and often it is also written uh, id of n, and the reason is because it is the identity function. And often, if you take a group theory course, you will realize that, oh, a, a very fundamental property of a group is having an identity. And that's right, we, when we talk about Dirichlet convolutions in the following videos, we will see how this identity function plays into uh, the group uh, action on Dirichlet convolutions. So i of n 
says I of n is equal to uh, 1 if n equals 1 and 0 if else. Wonderful. Perfect other function. So that's a very useful function, and we'll see why it is useful in the following videos. And the last function on our list today is the function capital N. And do not confuse this with the boldface N, often written like this or uh, like that, uh, however you would like to write it. But this represents the naturals. So this represents the natural numbers. Now this function n, capital N, is an arithmetic function which says I'll take an input n and I will spit out that same input n. It is a wonderful function and it should always be used. And it is very important in number theory. And we will see why in the following video when we talk about Dirichlet convolutions. Thank you very much.